Well, good morning, Gray City. Good morning. We having a good time so far? Awesome. Well, for those of you who I don't know yet, I'm James Pulitz, another one of our associate pastors here at Grace City. And um, normally you'll find me back with our production team back there making the services happen, having a lot of fun doing it. And, uh, but today I am thrilled to have the opportunity to speak today. Um, it's definitely an honor and privilege to be up here, to be trusted with your time, because uh, God's got a word today. He's got a word for you. Amen? All right, so, but I, I want to start, because I'm fairly new here. We've only been here uh, about a year, so I wanted to start off sharing a little about myself and about my family. So, this here is my lovely family. We got Rochelle. Uh, her and I have been married just about 16 years now. It'll be 16 years uh, next month. Then my uh, beautiful daughter, Sophia, she is 12 Asher here is nine, and Finley just turned six on Thursday. They are so much fun. I love them. Being uh, their dad is one of the best parts of my life. So um, I grew up in a suburb of Portland, Oregon, right outside of the city, and uh, didn't, start, didn't grow up going to church, but I started going to church my freshman year of high school. And that's actually where Rochelle and I met Bryn right about that time. Now, some of you have been asking, and we do not have pictures of Bryn during her goth phase. I know, she, it's true, it happened, we heard about it, but that was just a little bit before we met her. So I'm sorry, just to answer that for everybody now, I know people keep asking, we don't have those, but uh, it did happen, it's true. So, <laughs> one, one Wednesday night, my freshman year of high school uh, at church, I gave my heart to the Lord. That day, I don't remember what the youth pastor spoke about as normally, sorry Justin, we don't, but we do remember what God was doing. The youth pastor showed a video that showed all this pain, this hurt, and suffering in the world. And I remember that moment saying, Lord, I'm gonna give you my life if you use me to be part of the solution. That moment was the moment I gave my heart to the Lord. And that moment, is a moment I went all in. I went all in. I started as a student volunteering with the youth group. If the youth pastor needed soda to fill up the soda machine, I'd get my little 83 Datsun Nissan Pulsar, fill it full, and it was barely getting up the hill to the church. But I would do whatever. I went to a Christian university to study ministry. I started working full time at a church. I was doing everything that I could for God. Yes, I felt like I was doing everything right. But one thing that I kept running up against was myself. There was this, this wall that I kept hitting, feeling like I'm not good enough. I'm not doing enough for God, even though by all appearances, I was doing the right things. I was reading my Bible, I was praying, I was leading, I was devoting my life to ministry but it felt like there's this wall, that I just wasn't enough. And over time, I realized that that wall was me not seeing myself the way God sees me. And I think that's been the biggest struggle, the biggest stumbling block for me and my faith. And I think as followers of Christ, I think that's probably one of our biggest hurdles in our faith, is seeing ourselves the way that God sees us. So uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. First John 3, 1 John 3.1 says, what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. God has taken you what you were and made you new. Your sins are are washed away. You are forgiven. You have been adopted into the family of God. We are now children, siblings of Jesus. We have this new identity that has been given to us with honor, with authority, with power. The things that we just said, like echoing the authority of Jesus that we sang about first, that is what he has given us. But maybe we acknowledge it though up here and know it's true, but do we believe it in here? That was my problem is that in here, I knew it here, but in here, it wasn't sticking. Ephesians 4, 22 and uh, 
through 24 says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So when we don't walk in that new self, in our new identity as children of God, we can't experience the abundant life we are meant to have as followers of Jesus. We can't. When we don't walk in that identity as children of God, we miss out on the abundant life meant for us, on the blessings, the power, the authority, the promises of God. I've often heard people say, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Well, while you were a sinner saved by grace, you are so much more now You are a child of the king. You are made holy and righteous through Jesus. You have power, authority, and you are part of the royal priesthood of God, a citizen of heaven. That's who you are now. You are saved by grace, but now you are something new. And God has given us this new identity as his children. It's yours. It's true. It's here. It's now. But you miss out on those power and blessings by not living in it, by not walking in it. You need to put on the new self. You have to live in it and see yourself the way God sees you. Now, Jesus told a great story that really gives us two examples of living this way, of living the old life, of living not seeing ourselves the way God sees us. That story is called the prodigal son. You may have heard of it, right? I think it's better called a tale of two sons, and you'll see why here shortly. So if you have a Bible and you want to follow along, you can turn to Luke chapter 15. So the story Jesus tells is about a father and two sons. The younger son asks the father for his portion of his inheritance. Now, what you need to know about this is this was the equivalent of telling your dad, screw you, I wish you were dead. That's what he was saying. In that culture, in that time, like your inheritance was given when your father passed away. His, he was like, dad, I wish you were dead and I had your stuff. Like in this honor, shame culture that they lived in, that was the equivalent of just like saying, I want nothing to do with you ever again. Give me what's mine. So the father though is gracious and he divides this estate. He doesn't just, you know, excommunicate the son and say, get out of here. No, he's gracious. He divides his stuff. And not long after that, this younger son decides to pack up his stuff and leave to a distant land and starts using that wealth and partying it up. So Jesus says he squanders his wealth on wild living. It's kind of like, I think, you know, people who win the lottery, you hear these stories of people who win the lottery and they just go nuts, right? They, got, they have all the fun in the world. They start spending their money. They're buying gifts for everybody they know. They're partying it up, throwing these big shindigs and like they got this entourage that they're paying for but the only reason they have the entourage is because they're paying for them right like that is what this son was doing he was living it up going to town you get the idea this is that old self that ephesians talked about that that's being corrupted by those deceitful desires that was in him this is often what people's stories look like before coming to christ Sometimes they grew up in church and, you know, they heard about the love of Jesus, but other times they didn't. And they're just living like what they're seeing in their culture, what they're seeing around them, trying to have the most fun, use what they got, and just living life up. It's a pretty common story. But for this younger son, it didn't last long. Eventually, money runs out, right? And worse than that, the land he was living in experienced a severe Famine. So there's no food, his money's gone, and it hits him real hard. So with nothing left and he's starving, he hires himself out to be a uh, person who feeds pigs. Now, the idea here in the culture, pigs were unclean, ceremonial unclean to the Jews. So to be one, someone who cares for pigs, that's like about the lowest of lows. That's like the worst job he could probably find, aside from maybe being a prostitute, right? That was about as bad as it gets. Now, he says that even the food the pigs had looked good to him, and he was just wanting people to give him some. He didn't even have what the pigs had. That's how bad he was in, the spot he was in. But then he remembered the goodness of his father. He thought he might have a way out. He said... 
How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I'm starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and earth. I've sinned against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he recognizes the goodness of the father, that he's good, and he recognizes his sin, his failures, and his shortcomings. That's what we do when we come to Jesus, right? We, we repent, we say, Lord, forgive me for what I've done. Forgive me for my sins. Forgive me for my shortcomings. But that's just part of this son's story. The other part of what he was saying is that he's not coming back to the father as a son, but he's coming back like a member of the community. Because he says, make me like a hired servant. So a hired servant in those days, you know, you hear about servants in the Bible and that, hey, Abraham sent out his servant. Those were servants that were like living in the household, that were like, they were kind of like part of the family. Uh, not born into the family, but they lived with the family, were taken care of. But a hired servant was someone who lived out in the community, would go work, maybe care for the sheep, and then at night go back to their own homes. So he was coming to the father thinking that um, maybe, maybe he could have a little mercy. The son focused on his old self based on his actions and what he's done. That's the way he approached the father. He thought mercy and being treated like a guy who cares for the sheep maybe was the best that he could do. He was focused on his sin and what he had done wrong. So a great example of this might be Simba from The Lion King. So I know last week, Brian talked about Hakuna Matata and The Lion King, so I thought, hey, why not? Let's keep the Lion King metaphors going because Lion King is fantastic. So actually, I hope Josh next week does it too. Keep three weeks in a row. That's really what I'm hoping. Josh, you're listening next week. Lion King, well, we're looking for it. Okay, but so Simba, young Simba, he's the son of Mufasa. Uh, Mufasa is the king of the Pride Land. However, Mufasa dies because of a plot by Scar, Simba's uncle, but Scar convinces Simba it's his fault and that he needs to run away and never come back. And, and Simba believes this lie. He believes that it's his fault that his father dies, and so he runs away and leaves the Pride Land. Now, time goes by. Simba grows up a little bit. He makes friends with a warthog and a uh, meerkat. They sing songs, apparently, and eat bugs. But one day, Nala, who's a childhood friend of his, comes hunting for food because there's none left in the Pride Land because of Scar. And she runs into Simba. And so she tells him how bad it is and tries to convince him, you are the king. You need to come back and be the good king that you are meant to be. But Simba can't see it. Simba refuses because all he sees is that he, it's his fault that Mufasa died, that his sin, his failure, because he thinks it's his fault, his dad died, disqualifies him from being the son and stepping in that inheritance and the authority that is rightfully his. And that's exactly what the younger son was like too. He felt disqualified because of what he had done. But, Despite that, the younger son goes back to the father and he leaves to head to his father's house. The father, though, when he sees him coming a long way off, is filled with compassion and runs to his son and embraces him and kisses him. Place yourself in the father's shoes for a second. You have this child that you think is making all the wrong choices, has run away, told you, I never want to see you again, and left. But then you see that kid coming back. Place your heart, yourself in the father's shoes there for a second. The, the joy, the hope that you have seeing that son there coming. And you get his response, right? You see that child, your heart's exploding with joy. You long to embrace that son. So the father, more than anything, wanted to be in a relationship with that son again. He wanted that son back in his home. And so it says, the father ran to meet him. Now, what Jesus is communicating here is a depth of love that we can easily miss in our day and age. So in that day and age, in their culture, running was something that was not dignified. That's your excuse too, right? 
That's why you don't run. It's not dignified. I'm, I'm, I'm too dignified for running. Well, in, in Portland, running was just a thing you did. That, that was, it was kind of like a badge of honor that you ran and, uh, you know, you were something because you were a runner. I think that was probably Nike's advertising department, but I digress. Okay, uh, back to the father. So uh, if somebody uh, were running, if you were somebody, you wouldn't run. You would send a servant to run for you because uh, the community, anybody seeing seeing him would think, this man has lost his mind. This, you don't do that. You don't run. You wait. You let the son come to you. Then you can embrace him, whatever. But the father didn't care about what the people around him said. He didn't care what looked good. The father only cared about having his son back. The father's love for the son was all that mattered. He threw his arms around him. He called for a robe and a ring to be placed on his finger. Now, that ring, that meant something to the son. That ring was a sign of authority, being able to make decisions on behalf of the family. The father was saying, no, 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 you are my son. Come back here. I am giving you that authority. I'm placing you in my family. And then he called his servants and said, prepare a party, prepare a feast. For this son of mine was dead, and he is alive again. He was lost and he was found. What mattered to the father was that his son was back. He was reunited and back in relationship with him. He wasn't going to let the sin come between them. It didn't matter what he'd done. It didn't matter the disrespect that he'd shown his father. It didn't matter that he wasted his uh, property, resources. None of that mattered. He wasn't going to let that relegate that son to a lesser place in the family. He wasn't going to let him be a hired servant. No, He was bringing him back into the family. None of the rest of that mattered because the father loves him because he is his child. And that's what matters to the father. And I wanna pause right now and take a moment and give you an opportunity. If you haven't received the father's love, that's the kind of love he has for you. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter the things in your past. The father wants to have that kind of relationship with you. He's running to you today saying, come, come. I want to love you. I want to embrace you. I want you in my family. I want you to be my child. Jesus says, scripture says Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Jesus. And that's what Jesus did on the cross. When he died and rose again, he made a way for you to be adopted into this family. So all you have to do is ask. All you have to do is come to the Father and then all the blessings, all the promises of God, all the authority and power are yours as a child. So uh, if I could have the lights come down and, and you close your eyes or bow your heads for a moment, I wanna give those of you who haven't made that decision to follow Jesus an opportunity to do that. And I wanna pray for you. So if, if, that's, if that's you uh, today, if you want to say, Lord, I want to be part of your family. Will you simply raise your hand so that I know who I'm praying for? I'll look off to my left. Anybody here? In the center. Am I right? If you want to be part of God's family, this is your opportunity for me to pray for you. All right, Lord, we thank you We thank you so much that through Jesus, through his death on the cross and his resurrection, you made a way for us to be adopted into your family, to experience that kind of love that the Father has for the Son is the kind of love that you have for us. Love so great that you weren't gonna spare your Son, that you sent Jesus to earth to make a way, to forgive the past, to wipe away our sins and make a way for us to have a relationship with you again. And we thank you for that. We thank you uh, for those today who are making that decision, who are praying in their heart, Lord, I want to follow you. And so Lord, we ask God that you would help them follow after you, that you would help them experience the love of the Father that you have for them and experience the blessing, the honor, the authority, the promises of God that you have available to them today. And Lord, uh, we ask that you would uh, help them along the way as they start this new journey of faith. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Amen. Well, give a hand for those who uh, made that prayer their own today. Uh, And so if that was you, if that prayer uh, you prayed, uh, we want to give you a resource. So after the service, we have a book at our information desk uh, called Fresh Start that will help you take the next steps in your faith. But we are not done yet today. I know normally some of you are like, oh, we do this at the end of the service. But I think God wanted to do it right now right in the middle when he's talking about his love. Because we have one other brother, remember? A tale of two brothers. One other brother that Jesus wanted to make sure we didn't miss out when he was uh, telling this story. So the older son. I bet uh, quite a few of you, you're like, okay, I don't relate to the younger son, right? I've kind of done things the right way. I've made good decisions. I kind of, you know, I've prayed. I go to church. I didn't go wild when all my friends were going wild. And you feel like you've been faithful, done things the right way. So maybe that, that older brother may be someone you, you'd relate to a little bit better. So he was a responsible one. He honored the father. He continued to work for the father once he had given his inheritance, even though the father gave his inheritance out and he could have made choices to do whatever he wanted as well. He stayed faithful. He stayed serving the father, working the land, working for his uh, father. Uh, he made good choice and did what's right. However, if, when we look at the story, we see another son who wasn't living in the true identity that the father had available for him. So let's look at the, his reaction when the father uh, decided to celebrate the son uh, when he returned. It says, when the older son was returning from work in the fields, he heard the, the sounds of a party. He, was asked, he asked the servant what was going on, and the servant told him about the brother returning, and the father had killed the fattened calf and was preparing a party for them to celebrate. The text says, he became angry and refused to go in. So the question is, you know, father's being generous, his love, why did the son get angry? So when the father came out to plead with him, the son tells him, I have served you all these years and never never disobeyed you. So he was saying, I have been dutiful. I have done what you've asked. I've honored you. I've not been like him, my brother. Here is a guy who, by all appearances, has done everything right. He probably coaches Little League, right? He goes to church. I'm sure he tithes. I mean, gives, he takes off work all week to serve at the youth camp. Uh, if you want to do that, talk to Justin afterwards at the youth conference. But these are all good things that he's done. Um, he served the father and done what is expected. He's probably a model citizen. So why does this act of love and celebration make him so mad, so indignant? He tells the father, your son, notice he doesn't say my brother, your son has wasted your property and wealth and dishonored you. Not just by wasting the property, you know, but by living immorally with prostitutes and and by asking for the inheritance in the first place. This is what's going on in this brother's head. He said, you throw a huge party for him with the best of your possessions, the fattened calf, but you never gave me a goat to have a little party with my friends. He's comparing himself with his brother. Based on his brother's actions, the way he lived his life, he thinks his brother's not worthy of celebrating. He sees the father's love as wasted on his brother. So let's pause on that for a second. Do I do the same thing? Do you do the same thing? Are there people we judge based on their past, based on how they live their lives, and treat them like they're not worthy of God's love? Or maybe just not as worthy as ourselves? Think about that for a moment, for yourself. What about addicts who cause so much pain to their family and loved ones? What about family members who lied, cheated, broke up the family? What about drug dealers or even human traffickers who've caused communities to stay in bondage and ruined so many lives? What about them? What's your heart attitude towards them? Are they worthy of God's love and mercy? Should they be accepted and welcomed back into the family of God? Should they be welcomed by the Father's love? Lord, reveal self-righteousness in our hearts, Lord. Forgive me for writing off people, passing judgment on those who you want to show your love to. Lord, open our eyes to see people the way you see them. Sons and daughters, people you desire to love, to bring back into relationship with you. Lord, help us not overlook others, no matter what their past looks like. Mm, Amen.
All right, back to, the, uh, back to the brother. The second half of his complaint is that he was never given a goat to have you know, a little party, a little feast with his friends. He sees the party, the blessings, the wealth poured out on his younger brother, on, but, but he feels like the father's overlooked him. How often do we feel the same way? Do we feel like we've done everything right? We've been faithful, we've been dutiful, we've done what God's asked, we go to church, we pray, we do good things like participating in Saturday Serve in two weeks, Saturday, June 10th, 10 a.m. Also good things, you should do that. You can talk to Faye about that as well. But these are good things. But it never seems quite enough for the father. That's the way the son looks at it. It seems like God is blessing other people and not us. It seems like other people are receiving the miracles in their family situations, but we're not. What about those times where money's tight, you've been giving faithfully, you're generous to others, but you've been praying for the, the provision and you haven't seen it come through. You think about, what about me? And that's what the brother's thinking. What about me? He acts as if, though, he's a servant of the father, deserving reward for his work. His service to his father is an attempt to earn his favor and his love. That's what the older brother is doing. And I know I spent much of my life doing the same thing. Even serving in ministry for years, working in the church, even serving with the production teams, I was working for the Father's love. I, di I didn't realize it. I was focused on the tasks and doing the good things before me. I was, you know, doing, learning things. I was serving. I was uh, doing all these things to help build the kingdom of God, knowing that's, that's good thing. That's what the Father wanted. But what I didn't realize is I was trying to do it to be worthy of God's love. I was trying to earn his affection. I can teach a small group and tell them that God's love was unconditional for them, no matter what they did, no matter what they said, no matter their past, God loves them unconditionally. But I had a hard time accepting that for myself because I was trying to earn his love, and I didn't realize it for so long. But I'm sure that's what the, the, the older son felt like too. It's like, I've, I've done all this. Why, why don't I have the Father's love like that? He worked for his father's reputation and wealth in the community. All good things. But when he saw how the father responded to the younger brother, the younger brother who lived a life completely opposite from him, completely disregarding the father, not trying to earn, not doing all the good things, but the father poured out his love on him, this older brother had a moment where it didn't, the way he worked, the way he thought about his father, didn't match what he was seeing. He thinks, surely I've been wrong about the Father's love and his love for me and his goodness if this warrants celebration. But then we get the Father's response. The Father said, my son, the Father said, you are always with me. Everything I have is yours. He's saying, you're looking at this all wrong. He's saying, the older son was spending so much time doing for the father, he missed the father's heart. He was doing for instead of being with the father. The father said, you are always with me. You've been with me. You're always here. The son took care of the flocks. He took care of the fields. He managed the household. But he wasn't being with the father. In all those years of working for him, he wasn't being with him. And that's what I... That's what I had done for so many years. I was working for God and not taking the time to be with him. Because if we are with the Father, we should be learning and knowing his heart. We're not his servants, we are his children. And because he was spending so much time doing for the Father, he missed his heart. And we miss that too. We miss the heart of the Father when we are too busy doing for the Father instead of being with him. Beyond that, the older son had his inheritance already. That means all that the father had, all that the son uh, could ask for was already his. He'd given him his inheritance, the possess possessions, the authority, the power. He could have had that party with his little goat. Right? He could have. 
But he was near to the Father, but he didn't know him. He didn't realize what it truly meant to be his child. And this is what it's like when we focus our doing for the Father and we miss his heart. We can't walk in the authority and the power and the promises and the privileges of the Lord if we are doing for him instead of being with him. This is kind of what Paul said, kind of like what Paul said in 2 Timothy when he said, having a form of godliness but denying its power. You're doing the right things, but you're lacking all the power. But the father saw the older son exactly the same way as he saw the younger son. He was a full son, a full child, not just a servant. It didn't matter what he'd done. It doesn't matter how good he's been or the works he's done. The father's love for him is because he is his child. The, re- the relationship, being with the son, is what mattered to the father. All the father's resources, promises, blessings, they're available to the son. Not because of his work, not because of what he's done, but because he is his child. Amen? And that's what we are too. We can't earn his love. The things we do don't get it. It's because of Jesus and what Jesus did for us. So application. Let's get to the application here. Uh, What can we do? What, What can we take home? Because we, ultimately, we need to see ourselves the way God sees us, right? That's the problem. That's the problem that both sons had. One saw as not as a son who's not worthy to be a son. One saw that his work was a thing that deserved his love. Neither of them were right. They were children of God, given uh, new identities or identities because they were his children. And that's what we need to see as well. So we need to live in the, these truths that we are the new creation. We are his children, and we aren't to settle for the lies of the enemy that say we are something else. That, our work, that we have to work for his love or that what we've done disqualifies us from his love. So how do you fight these lies? I've got two simple tools and they seem real simple. One, read the Bible. Simple as that, read the Bible, specifically the New Testament because how can you know what the Father thinks about you if you don't read and hear what the Father thinks about you. That's what the, is in the New Testament. It's the story of God's love for you and how he sees you, especially through the eyes of Jesus, through what Jesus did on the cross. So one, read the Bible. That's a first step in fighting these lies of the enemy. Step two, meditate on scripture so that you know who you are to God. Now, some of you may think, okay, meditate, that's a new age thing. No, simply meditating on scripture means thinking about it over and over. Keep coming back to it. And, you know, it's really pretty simple. Maybe you put a post-it note on your car dash with a verse. Maybe you write a verse on your car mirror. Maybe you put, uh, as your home screen on your phone, a verse that says what God thinks about you. Because you, you got to know, you got to anchor into the word of God to know what God says about you. So I've got some verses for you. Up here. So, uh, there you go. Take a picture of this. Take a picture. These are things, these are verses that say who God says you are. These are, if you need to know where to start, where to meditate, what to meditate on, what God thinks about you, start here. Start here. Because there is power in declaring these things. There's power in getting these things into your head. And I think that's what it took for me, was sitting on scripture, slowing down enough to get these things into my heart, to see God, the, see myself the way God saw me. So if you relate to the younger brother, you, you need to start declaring these over yourself. These things that say who God says you are. You are not just a sinner saved by grace. You were a sinner saved by grace, but now you are something new. You are a new creation in Christ. You are a child of God. You are the royal priesthood of God. You are a citizen of heaven. That is who you are. And there is power in declaring those things, using your words to declare those things over yourself. And if you were like the older brother, maybe you need to stop focusing on what you're doing and slow down just to be with Jesus. It may feel counterintuitive to do less, but maybe it's just that slowing down and hearing from the Lord. Because if, if you slow down and you put yourself in a place to hear from God, he will speak to you. 
because that's his heart for you. He wants to speak to you. He wants you to hear his voice. And the more you slow down, the more you spend time with him, not just doing for him, not just reading the Bible to check off a list, like I read my Bible, I did my Bible reading, this is what I gotta get through. No, the more you slow down and say, Lord, what do you have for me? What do you wanna speak? You will learn to hear his voice. And if you've you struggle to hear God's voice, you're in luck. Starting next week, Josh has his new series, Tune In, where he's gonna be talking about tuning in and learning how to hear God's voice. So come back, you won't wanna miss that. So let me pray for us today. No matter where you are, no matter if you relate to the younger son feeling like you've been far from God or disqualified in the past, or if you feel like the older son where you, uh, you've been working and not feeling, you're feeling overlooked, feeling like, you know, you, you can't do enough. We have a father who loves us as, because we are his children, because of what Jesus did on the cross. So Lord, we pray that today you would help us anchor into the truth that we are your children. We are your new creations created in Christ Jesus. That we aren't what we once were, we are not defined by our past, by our actions, by sins that we may have committed, nor are we defined by the work we do or, or the good things we attempt for your sake, for your kingdom. But because of Jesus, we are adopted into your family. We are your children. We are loved by you. And you want to pour out your abundant love and blessings. You want us to experience your abundant life. And we know that starts with accepting the fact that we are your children. We thank you for your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen.